Buenas noches. Señor Secretario, Embajador Maná, Presidente Joffrey, Consul Cuevas, Señor Phelps y miembros de la comunidad de Iowa State University, bienvenidos a todos y gracias por venir. Yo me llamo Michael Whiteford y soy el decano provisional de la Facultad de Artes Liberales y Ciencias. Es un verdadero honor esta noche de tener con nosotros uno de nuestros estudiantes pasados, el doctor Luis Ernesto Derbez, el secretario de Relaciones Exteriores de la República de México. Pero antes de empezar con su ponencia, es un placer de introducirles a nuestro presidente de la universidad, el doctor Gregory Joffrey. El presidente Joffrey va a presentarles al doctor James McCormick, jefe del Departamento de Ciencias Políticas. En cambio, él tendrá el honor de presentarles al distinguido y honorable secretario de Relaciones Exteriores de México. Good evening, Mr. Secretary, Ambassador Manat, President Joffrey, Consul Cuevas, Mr. Phelps, and members of the Iowa State community. Thank you for coming out on this dreadful evening, and thank you for helping us welcome a returned veteran of Iowa State days to his home. My name is Michael Whiteford, and I am the interim dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. It is a very special honor to have with us this evening one of our former students, Dr. Luis Ernesto Derbez, the Foreign Minister of Mexico, and a PhD in economics. Welcome back. To get things going, it's my pleasure this evening to introduce you to the president of Iowa State University, Dr. Gregory Joffrey. President Joffrey, in turn, will introduce Professor James McCormick, the chair of the Department of Political Science. Dr. McCormick will have the honor of introducing our distinguished guest, Dr. Luis Derbez. President Joffrey. Thank you, Mike, and uh, thanks to all of you for joining us this evening for the second Manat Phelps Lecture in Political Science. Uh, this is indeed a very special night for us uh, as we welcome back to campus our distinguished speaker, His Excellency uh, Dr. Derbez, Secretary of Foreign Affairs of Mexico, and as you heard, an Iowa State University alumnus. This is a wonderful lecture series. Uh, it brings to campus uh, distinguished speakers like we have tonight to interact with our faculty and students, uh, to stimulate uh, their thinking, uh, challenge perhaps views, uh, and it's a very important part of the overall educational experience here at Iowa State uh, to enrich the total educational experience of our students and our faculty. Of course, it's also a great opportunity for us to showcase uh, the talents of our faculty and staff and our beautiful campus, even though it's uh, raining like cats and dogs. I want to uh, thank all of those involved in uh, making uh, tonight a reality. Uh, first of all, the University Lecture Series, uh, led by Pat Miller. The government and the student body for providing some of the funding uh, for the lecture series, and especially uh, GSB's Institute for World Affairs. Uh, the Departments of Political Science and Economics and the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at Iowa State. And very especially, uh, two Iowa State University alumni who made this lecture series possible through their financial support. Ambassador Charles Manat and Thomas Phelps. Fellow Iowa State University alumni, longtime law partners who created the very successful Manat Phelps uh, Law Firm and now the Manat Phelps Lecture Series. Uh, thank you, Chuck and Tom, and I'd like to ask both of you to stand so that we can recognize you. It's 
now my pleasure to introduce Dr. James McCormick, Chair of Iowa State University's Department of Political Science, who will introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. McCormick. Thank you, President Joffrey, for that warm welcome. On behalf of the Department of Political Science, I, I would also like to welcome you and thank you for joining us at the second annual Manat Phelps Lecture in Political Science. As President Joe Free has just mentioned, this lecture series was made possible by a generous gift to the department by Charles and Kathleen Manat and Tom and Elizabeth Phelps. We are privileged that they are in attendance with us this evening. The intent of the Manat Phelps Lecture in Political Science is to bring to campus each fall a prominent scholar or practitioner in the area of political economy who will speak to the significant developments that have occurred in that area in the previous year and who will address how transnational issues in this area affect and are affected by the events in the state of Iowa. Our aim is to make this annual lectureship the premier event on international political economy in Iowa and beyond. I believe that we can wholly meet that goal with our distinguished speaker this evening. Our speaker has a highly distinguished career in public service and education in the area of international economics and now in foreign policy. After receiving his PhD in economics from Iowa State in 1980, Dr. Derbez served as Professor of Economics and Academic Vice President at the University of the Americas in Mexico. He then spent 14 years, 1983 through 1997, working at the World Bank, where he served as Division Chief for Asian and South Asian countries and as Lead Economist for Mexico and Central America. During those assignments, Dr. Gerber led important missions to develop structural adjustment programs, financial and financial and banking reforms in Latin American, African, and Southeast Asian nations. Between 1997 and 2000, Dr. Gerber served as an independent consultant to the Mexico City Office of the World Bank and for the Inter-American Development Bank in Washington, D.C. During that time, he was deeply involved in the economic recovery programs in Honduras and Nicaragua after Hurricane Mitch did so much damage to those countries and their economies. With the election of Vincente Fox as President of Mexico, Dr. Derbez was appointed as Minister of the Economy and served in that post from December 2000 to January 2003. On January 15th of this year, Dr. Derbez was appointed to his present post as Secretary of Foreign Affairs for Mexico. As you can see, Dr. Derbez is uniquely qualified to address issues of the global economy in the Manat Phelps Lecture in Political Science. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you His Excellency, Dr. Luis Ernesto Derbez, the Secretary of Foreign Affairs of Mexico. Dr. Derbez. Thank you very much. I, uh, I wish, I wish that we finalize all these migration issues so that you can all become Mexican citizens and vote for me whenever you are there. Um, first of all, let me, let me thank uh, both uh, Charles Manad and Thomas Phelps for the opportunity of being here in what I consider to be my alma mater. You know, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a very difficult thing to say how I feel about being here in front of you in this campus not taking my final PhD exam, but rather <laughs> my first exam in front of an audience such as yourself. 
It's, uh, it's a privilege to have been in Iowa State. It is something that I will keep for always, you know, not only because I do have the degree, but also because I have all these memories and this extraordinary education that I acquired while I was here. So I really want to thank, again, Mr. Mann and Mr. Phelps for the opportunity. But I also want to thank President Goffrey and uh, Mike and Mr. You know, uh, Mr. Whiteford because what they have done is uh, they gave me this opportunity to walk during the whole day yesterday, not today, uh, on campus and uh, look at all these buildings where I spend uh, endless nights studying, but also a fantastic time. It's um, very difficult to say to you what you will feel when you come back to this university after you graduate and uh, you will see how things have changed but also how things remain the same. How young people are still running around sitting in a chair, cramming for an exam, uh, going downstairs uh, to the Memorial Union and buying some snacks or whatever they were buying at the time, and thinking about what will be the future like once they end their school years. Hell, let me tell you. Yes, hell. <laughs> so you want to stay in school, OK? <laughs> Thank you very much for being here with me. Let me uh, just to say that um, in addition to this, I was a little bit concerned as um, you know, my initial speaker was making this presentation because he was telling everything in Spanish and I was getting very concerned. I said, my God, I will have to translate my speech. Because, um, <laughs> it is all in English and all of a sudden I have this feeling that I will have to talk in Spanish. So I hope you don't mind if I do it in English. <laughs> Let me say that um, this invitation allows me a great opportunity. What I've seen today in Iowa is a big transformation from the Iowa that I saw when I was a student here about 23 years ago. It's, um, it's a fantastic change that we can see. First of all, because um, when you look at the events that have been shaping the world recently, you realize that uh, what happened on September 11 of the year 2001 really made a big change in what we will be looking at in the future as the important international events. The dramatic and sovereign event that really awakened even the most reluctant of all of us to face that the challenge for our societies now will be linked on terrorism, will be linked to security issues, will be linked to the need to really look at a completely different world where such that I don't think there is any doubt in our minds that whatever we are facing today is completely different to what we were facing before. The threat of terrorism, the threat of uh, organized uh, narco-traffic is something that has been affecting the world and in particular my country. And I feel that uh, the definition of new policies for this world is something that we are still searching for. It's very complicated. My job is very complicated. But it is complicated because it's not clear what we should be doing from now on. We are all trying to grasp with these issues, and we're all trying to look forward and see what we can do. And there must be no mistake. All states are now responsible for finding ways that will allow us to confront these international threats that exist and were not there before September 11. We need to cooperate. We need to ensure stability. We need to make sure that valuable institutions, international institutions, will be there so that they will respond to this multilateral threat with multilateral action. And that's why when you look at the organization of the United Nations, or you look at the organization like the American States Organization, you find out that multilateral approaches to find the solution to what this threat of terrorism is affecting upon us, it is a key and essential factor. That's why if you want to uphold all these processes and procedures of international law, you will need to make sure that the only way that mankind will be able to live in harmony is if we all, states responsible to keep that harmony, work together and provide the international environment that will be required. This fight against terrorism, against organized crime, against drug and weapons trafficking, and other forms of transnational crime has really transcended the way the capabilities of any single nation. It is much more powerful than one single nation 
no matter how big, how strong, how important that nation feels it is. We need to continue to build really a broad and very strong international consensus that effectively will translate into coordinated policies and the adoption of joint measures among nations in the world. This is only possible by looking at the threat of security as what we now call in the Americas a hemispheric conference just defined as a multidimensional perspective on the security issue. This has to consider not only what you see happening, but also what are the root causes of these illegal activities, of this threat that we are facing. And once again, we have to make sure that it's through international institutions that we really put together the forums that will allow us to find out solutions to this threat. My country, in particular, has always sought to avoid the outbreak of armed confrontation, has always constantly and actively pursued, negotiated, and when possible, preventive solutions being given for any kind of international controversy that we're facing. And that's why we hosted last week a special conference on security of the Organization of American States. This conference, which took place last week in Mexico City, came with the conclusion that security was a multidimensional issue, that you could not close the door on only one single definition of what security was all about, and you had to include a series of potential aspects that each nation will confront and each nation will define as a security threat for its own stability. This conference just came out and defined a very good concept of what security constitutes, and this goes beyond with your traditional common military definition of the term. This makes room for other variables that exist in many of our countries, variables like poverty, disease, and the fight against organized crime as security threats for the nations. And going beyond this unidimensional concept of security as a military definition has allowed now all the countries in this hemisphere to come out with a better process of how to fight all those little elements that are affecting our concept of security. This is something that has to be taken into consideration. Unless you really go and fight against the roots of these problems, poverty, the need for social development, the need for a new structural definition of war against crime, unless you put all this together, it will be very difficult for any nation to have economic and political stability in the long run. I believe that in a state with such a long-standing political tradition as Iowa is, with this important, always important caucuses in the process of defining who will be the next President of the United States, there is very little need for all of you and for me to underscore what and how important it is political and economic stability for the democratic process in the world. The central role, therefore, of uh, the economy is the maintenance of democracy, social stability, and international security. The end of the Cold War really changed the process of what we felt was the balance of power in the world. And in addition, when the economic globalization process started taking hold of our societies, we faced all of a sudden a completely different world and different needs in order to put together our institutions. If you add to that the threat that came with September 11, you find out why is it that today it's so complex and so difficult for all of us to define one single strategy that will respond to the threat on the security in our borders, in our countries. And that's why we need to work together in that part. It is the greatest international challenge. This is the lack of an equitable development between the states and regions. It is a threat to national security, the fact that the increase of social poverty and increased marginalization in many of our countries have gendered and generated the essence of what will be the problems in the future in terms of the security threats to our nations. What we have now is that we need to work. For Mexico, we need to do several things that are important. The first one is we have to strengthen our democratic governance. We need to make the decision process more transparent. We now have to fight corruption. It also means that in countries like Mexico, we have to seek structural reforms that will make markets more efficient, more clear, more transparent in their own process. And we need to be able to bring together all these things because that's the only way 
that globalization will pay off. That's the only way that we will attract investment, that we will have new technologies and new developments in countries such as ours. The reason for that is we need this environment, these clear rules, these transparent rules, if we want to join hands with other countries and work together in this globalized context where security issues have become a major and essential element of economic development and cooperation between nations. We in Mexico have the advantage of being able to work on these goals within what is called a regional economic framework, one that has proven in the past 10 years is used in terms of the results. This is the NAFTA treaty that the three countries, Canada, the United States of America, and Mexico, have signed, have put in place, and are working together. Since we signed NAFTA 10 years ago, the level of economic development, the creation of jobs, and the welfare improvements have been simply significant. It is very impressive what we have gotten so far, because although we were always good neighbors, we never have become good partners. NAFTA has given us that partnership and that possibility of growing. And the numbers speak for themselves. Since 1994, intra-regional trade has grown by 128%, and it has started from $297 billion in the year 1993. We now have a trade, regional trade between the three nations, which goes almost to $700 billion. This means that we are trading every single day almost $2 billion in products. And what this implies is if security concerns are going to get on the way, the possibility of this trade is going to be absolutely and completely disrupted. That's why when you look at the links between security, globalization, trade, you find out finally how important it is for us to work together in this. Last year, Mexican sales to the United States and Canada represented 91% of the total export value of Mexico to the world. This is how important trade has become for Mexico in the relationship with Canada and the United States. The regional partners, United States and Canada, have become the number one and number two trading partner for Mexico. But at the same time, Mexico is also now the second export destination for United States goods. We represent now your second larger market in terms of the production of goods going into our economy and being consumed. And what this implies is that NAFTA has become a two-way traffic and benefit process. Not only Mexico has benefited, but also the United States, because we are now sending into our country this level of important goods. Only Japan is uh, stronger and superior to what we are doing in that comparison. And if you look at the exports that you are sending to the Mexican market, Mexico represents more than five European countries together. All that you export to England, France, Germany, Spain, and Italy, all of that is less than what you export to Mexico in one particular year. We are a larger and bigger market, and we have a stronger relationship, therefore, with your country than we used to have before the NAFTA treaty. This is the result and the benefit of NAFTA. When you look at these things, you will see that uh, every time that you see the response, you will have to accept that even though benefits have not been distributed equally between the United States and Mexico and Canada, the three countries nevertheless have benefited from this increased trade that this regional integration has given to all of us. At the state and local level, it is also important. Iowa's exports to Mexico, for instance, grew from $150 million in 1993 to almost $400 billion in the year 2001, an increase which goes beyond 150% in this particular concept. Mexico is now the second largest trading partner for this state of Iowa. And uh, at first sight, you will not have thought that. You would have thought that there was nothing relation between Iowa and Mexico other than a student from Iowa State University. When, when you look at these things, you find very clearly that the Iowa economy is tremendously and strongly linked to the Mexican economy. Because you are exporting corn, you are exporting soybean, you are exporting pork into Mexico at a level that was never imaginable before the NAFTA treaty. This is how dependence becomes important, not only at the national level, but also at the regional level between nations. This economic and commercial relationship between our two nations has necessarily been accompanied 
by the development of political and social transnational bonds. As some of you probably remember, President Bush and other high-ranking officials have repeatedly highlighted the importance of our partnership. Both nations are, I think, fully aware at this point in time of the fact that we have a common agenda which is extremely vast and complex, and both governments consider this relationship a top priority. Next week, we will be having what is called the Bilateral Commission meeting in Washington, D.C. At that meeting, we are going to be discussing issues of great importance for both nations. They will range from the political dialogue to the concept of security issues, border and transnational crossing, migration, and of course, the multilateral approach that we will be taking to issues such as Iraq, such as other big problems in the world. Handling these issues is not an easy task. Many of these uh, bilateral issues that we had in the past have more and more become visible because they are really showing now uh, strong links in Mexico City and in Washington and also in the Mon Island. And when you look at these people who are in the field, political scientists, commentators, now consider all of these issues between Mexico and the United States to be called what they are now in quotes naming intermestic politics. This is a term that has been coined where it describes that the boundaries between domestic and foreign policies in the relationship between Mexico and the United States have become very blurry and almost impossible to identify. The more than our societies intertwine, the more than we keep growing as this relationship, not only in economic terms but in social terms, the more that Hispanics, which are the fastest growing population group in the state of Iowa and in the United States, keep being there, our political systems will have to move closer to some kind of agreement and combination that will make our lives completely different. This is one of the decisions that we have to take and that we have to ponder. How do we go through the process of this linkage, not only in economic terms, but also in population terms between our two societies? And this is really one of the most important issues of what we are calling the intermestic political dynamics. It is the region's migration patterns and what will imply in terms of this common geography that we share. This is the topic of my lecture tonight. We are not only interlinked by trade, we also have to start looking very clearly on how this relationship between Mexico and the United States is taking new shape because of the growing population flows that are coming into the United States and we need to look at this linkage between the two societies over time. If you look at this, ever since the mid-19th century, Mexican communities have lived and thrived in the United States. Many waves of economic migrants have moved north looking for the jobs that they could not find in their own communities in Mexico. For most of the history, if you look at this process, the border between our countries has been largely open for the crossing of people and goods. If you were to ask any of your grandparents what was the situation in terms of the crossing in the early 20th century between Mexico and the United States, you will be surprised. People will move across the border practically without documents. They will simply walk through this imaginary border and they will be either in the United States or in Mexico. And when you look at the way families were composed at the time, you will be pretty much surprised to find out that some people from the same family will settle on one side of the border and the others on the other side of the border, but they never recognized what was the difference between the two borders. They didn't know that they were living either in the United States or in Mexico, and that made a big difference. There were no difference at the time of the early 20th century. People kept moving back and forth. Communities were moving back and forth, and they were able to work on one side and rejoin their communities and their families on the other side if they so wished and desired. During the World War II, at the end of that, the need for workers in the United States increased dramatically. And thus, the two countries agreed to create what was called, at the time, a former you know, temporary working scheme called the Bracero Program. This program did not stop the parallel flow of people that were crossing the border without this specific relationship, but it really started to change the concept of how this migration flow will have to be conducted. And this is what I will call now that slowly we began building an invisible barrier, an invisible wall between our two societies. With the Bracero program, we gave the first step. We decided, both governments, to create a scheme that will define very clearly where the borders were, 
and who was on which side of the border in this particular program. The Brazero program was a good, strong program that meant demand and supply on both sides of the border for labor will be matched through a joint effort of both governments, both societies, to match this demand and supply. As you know, there was a tremendous valuable input from workers into the United States economy and vice versa by the amount of jobs that we provided in the United States and allowed our families in Mexico to remain there and live on better conditions than they were before. You have uh, this guarantee for our workers of better working conditions and better salaries. And people came and went back to Mexico after they finished their periods in this Brasero program. The governments were not able to translate what this scheme, this successful scheme became into a long-term strategy. Policies responded to economic cycles and domestic pressures. And in 1964, the Brasero program was ended by common agreement of both governments on both sides of the border. Now, when you look at that, you wonder, how come that you end this Brasero program if the need for workers remain there in the United States economy and the need for jobs remain there in the Mexican economy? How come that all of a sudden we stopped that program and we began building what I call this invisible wall between the two places defining our borders? Well, what happened was that people thought that legally you have to put together now this definition. How do you make the crossing between the two borders in the two societies and two economies? But in Mexico, we have excess labor. And in the United States, you have a demand for labor. So despite the fact that we finished this temporary working program, people kept moving north and kept coming into the United States looking for the jobs that were available on this side of the community. As you work in this process, what happened was the risks for the people who were looking for jobs began to increase. People were moving north, and what they did is they began bringing their families up to the northern part of Mexico. And as they settled in the northern part of Mexico, they went across the border, worked on the American side, and came back to sleep, so to speak, at their own homes on the Mexican side. This created a different approach. This is what I call now the revolving door approach. People walking in in the mornings and coming back at night so that they can do their jobs on the American side and still live on the Mexican side. But by then, the definition of which side was which was already put in place. So we have this clear concept now, what side was Mexico, which side was the United States. The wall kept growing and kept being more and more evident between the two nations. As we move in that direction, people in the late 80s began to come into larger numbers because of the population dynamics that happened in my country. At the time, we were growing at the rate of about 3.6% population growth, which was a tremendous rate. And people were looking for jobs that could not be generated in Mexico, kept coming and coming in larger and larger numbers to the United States economy. In the late 1980s, because of this concept and the feeling that there were too many people crossing the border, the United States adopted policies and legislation that focused almost exclusively on border control, and eventually they began to build what is called physical walls between our peoples. So we went from the concept to the physical reality. Today, we are certain, and the empirical evidence is solid, that the build-up in border enforcement has not reduced the number of unauthorized border crossings. It is also probably causing immigrants to stay for longer periods of time in the United States, and more importantly, we know that the current policies have led to an still increasing number of deaths in the treacherous process of crossing the borders at this point in time. This is true. This is not something that is fiction. As we moved more and more in that process, we found out more and more that people kept coming into the United States looking for jobs. As the barriers began to increase, something very funny happened. The rotating door stopped being rotating and became a fixed door. And people then knew that in order to come and get a job, they had to open that door any way they could, cross the border, and stay on the American side, because now they could not go back and forth easily. And they were afraid of losing their job and their source of income. The policies that we implemented in the late 80s, early 90s, created this situation. And it was the beginning of what we are seeing today. It was the beginning of this tough policy where you will then define if I want to keep my family, then I have to come with my family 
to the United States. It's not only that I cross the border, I get a job, and then I go back to Mexico, but rather I will bring my family one way or the other and start settling people on this side of the border. If you look at the way that the migration patterns happen, this is the time when we, what is called now the networks of communities began being built. What you will see now is communities in the southern parts of Mexico, which are absolutely related to communities in California, Illinois, and many other states in the United States, where they will live and they will keep their traditions and their contacts. And therefore, they will start bringing in more and more people from their community in Mexico into the United States side. As you did that, the growth in Mexican-American population really went very strongly in the United States side. This is the flow that we were facing. This was a reality. And the response in terms of policies was not to do a Bracero program or a flexibilization of the migration policies, but exactly the opposite. To become harder and harder in terms of how you will be controlling this border crossing and creating conditions and legislation that simply provided incentives for people to come more and more into the United States to stay in the United States. This has created a tremendous disruption in your communities, but also in the Mexican communities. Make no mistake, the fact that people left behind wives and children created tremendous problems for the communities in Mexico, created social crisis in our own country. Because the moment that they left people behind, even though they were sending money to sustain and support their families on that side, at the same time, what is also true is that they were leaving behind only women and children in many small towns in Mexico. If you were to go to Mexico today, to many of the rural areas, what you will find out is communities where there are almost no young people, where the dream of many of the youngsters that you have is to go into the United States, and where only old people and a few women are left behind as time goes by. This problem, therefore, is not only a problem for the United States, it's also a problem for Mexico. Because what we are facing on our side of the border is the loss of workers, skills that they bring with them, and youth that is staying now in the United States, adding to your pool of workers and consumption and production, whereas we are losing these elements in our country. After over these 150 years of this complex migratory dynamics, the outcome is overwhelming. If you look uh, to what we call unofficial and unofficial statistics, about 25 million people of Mexican origin live today in the United States. This is one out of every 14 Americans. And even though they originally concentrated in the southern border states, many of them now have traveled north and east. New York and Chicago now have two of the largest Mexican communities in the world. In New York State, just to talk about one simple state, the number of people that we know that were born in Mexico, living now in the state of New York, has grown in the past five years from half a million to almost 800,000 today. This is the growth dynamics that you see in that particular state. And uh, people keep working more and more and more in different places in the whole area. And in Iowa, the Hispanic population, mostly Mexican, as I said before, has grown over 150% in the last decade. Now, when you look at that, you have to recognize that the work that has been brought in has created benefits for the communities where these people settle. And uh, as the United States population keeps going to age and the labor supply in the United States diminishes, if you want to keep your living standards, you will require more and more some migrants to take over those jobs that you need to have in your economy. So what you see now is a very interesting process that will take place in the next 20 years, where you will see the cycle of growing population in Mexico reaching its peak, and you will see your baby boomers disappear in the sense that they are no longer in the working force. And the two curves will be crossing what we think is in about 10 years. And at that point, it will make eminent sense for all of us, whether we like it or not, to talk about some kind of migration decision that will imply that just as we agreed to have NAFTA in terms of trading of goods and services, now we need to talk about trade of people as the key element to satisfy a completely clear process that has begun because our two societies are merging into one single point where our supply of labor 
will be equivalent to your demand of labor. And therefore, it will make sense to talk about the migration issue as part of the NAFTA agreement that we have to put together. What we are doing in Mexico is trying to push the calendar a little bit ahead of its proper cycle, in terms of age cycle. If you look at this thing, one of the problems that we're facing because of the way that we have done things is that many Mexican migrants are coming to this country without the proper documents and without the proper structure to be part of your communities in what I will call a normal relationship. So what you hear right now is about 5 million Mexicans who have been coming into the United States in the past 10 years do not have the proper documentation to be in this country. This is a major problem that we are facing in Mexico and that you are facing in the United States. September 11 has increased the sense of what do we do because security questions then began to be put forward in terms of who is my neighbor that is living here and was not born in the United States. And as you move into that one, you see the importance of September 11 and the whole relationship between our societies. The question that September 11 brought to all of us is security concerns will have to be dealt with. How we deal with those concerns will define what we can do in economic terms, in terms of growth, in terms of population dynamics in our societies. Therefore, this is the job that is ahead of us. So far, we have not done a good job. We took away, and I'm an economist, a market solution that was being defined at the early 20th century, and we made it a quota system that seemed to be working for a while, and then even that we threw away and we simply created the impossibility of defining market demand as the core of the solution, and we tried to create barriers that are becoming more and more a true wall. If you go today to the border between Mexico and the United States, you will see now a wall. This is not just an imaginary wall. It is a physical wall that seems to be built between the United States and Mexico in order to avoid the movement of people from Mexico into the United States. Let me tell you, it's not going to work. People will find ways through because there is the need on both sides of the border. There is a demand requirement in the United States side and there is a supply possibility on our side. As long as that happens, you will have people matching supply and demand and finding ways. But what you are also creating is something that is very dangerous for us and that we are trying to fight as hard as we can is the possibility of corruption on our side and also the possibility of people creating a mafia of transferring of people between Mexico and the United States. These two issues are bad for Mexico and are bad for the United States because it brings me back to the second concept of security that I was talking about. The facing of this delinquency which is organizing itself to do illegal acts and profiting from those acts. Just to give you an idea what it means, a Mexican worker who would like to come to the United States will have to pay somewhere between $3,000 to $7,000 for people to smuggle him into the country. And the more difficult these barriers become, the higher the price will be. The more important, therefore, that will be for illegal traffickers of people to be in that market and take the profit away from anything else. If you take away narco traffic, if you take away a few financial schemes, the process of passing people into the United States is becoming a very serious issue in terms of organized crime in our countries. Make no mistake, I'm now the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Mexico and I know what people offer for a visa, Mexican visa, in countries such as China, in order to be able to come to Mexico and from Mexico be transported into the United States market. The range of prices goes between $3,000 and $10,000 per visa. This is an element for corruption. The more you do that, the more you entice people to accept corruption and therefore enter into this illegal business of trafficking with people. We need to find a solution to those aspects because it is dangerous and it goes against security in both your nation and my nation. Having recognized therefore our shortcomings, the first question that comes to mind is what have we achieved? 
The strongest success has been the adoption of a common mental framework upon which both governments can really build now solid public policies. I think that on both sides now there is a recognition of the importance of migrant workers for our economies, our cultures, and our societies. I think that we understand now the need for systems that will ensure that our borders remain safe and that the national security is not put at risk. And I think that we both firmly believe now that no individual should risk his or her life in an attempt to cross the border looking for better economic opportunities. But the most important thing that we have learned is that our governments will have to find successful schemes of bilateral action we want to really bring this concept of corruption and danger to an end. The second key question then is, what are we doing now? And I think what we're trying to do is to define what will be our priorities. For the Mexican government is the creation of a bilateral, order, safe, secure, and humane institutional framework for migration with the United States government. The administration of President Fox has proposed an agenda for the achievement of these many significant steps that our people require. We still believe very firmly that progress has to be made and will be made in the following five fronts. First, we propose an increase in the yearly number of visas for Mexican citizens that are issued by the United States government in order to foster increased transboundary businesses and personal relationships. Finally, migratory flows through regulated schemes will always strengthen the security and legal certainty of individuals and states. The second item in the agenda is the creation of a strong temporary worker program. This is possible through the strengthening of the United States already existing H2 visa system. And I think that many members of your Congress have now recognized the importance of this proposal and have introduced a bipartisan bill.